Thank you. Hey, everyone. So welcome. We're really excited to have you here, um, whether you are tuning in live or, or watching this in the, in the recording later. I'm, I'm, I'm sure we're getting tons of hits by the time this is being, um, you know, seen um, off of the web. So we really wanted to come together because there's been this great growth of um, community psych publishing, and there's lots and lots of venues now that are out there to um, to really capture a wide range of our work and share it with um, both community psychologists and the rest of the world as well. And so this group is here to share some of their wisdom and ideas and what their journals are looking for. And I am here to facilitate that conversation and maybe say a little bit about the, the journal that I'm part of as well. So I'm Ann Brodsky. I'm in Washington, D.C. right now. Um, usually I well, usually I'd be at a conference where the conference was. So pretend that I'm in Australia. Um, I'm one of the co-founders and um, co-editors of um, CPGP, which is Community Psychology and Global Perspective. Um, and like I said, my role, um, depending on where you are this morning, this afternoon, this evening, is to facilitate this. And we hope we'll have a really lively conversation. We've got some stuff prepared to say, and then um, would, would love to hear um, your questions and thoughts about the publishing world and community psych as well. So I've asked each panelist to start um, off with an intro, with a description of kind of what the sweet spot of their particular journal that they're um, representing is, um, what their role in it is as well, and, and one helpful hint um, about um, publishing, um, either in their journal or writ large. And so we're going to go in alphabetical order by first name, if you're following along. Um, and so um, Alana is going to kick us off, I think. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Alana Zuckerman. And I am in Arizona currently, and I am the new incoming associate editor for the Community Psychologist. And uh, my colleague is, uh, I'll actually let him introduce himself before we go into more about our journal. <laughs> Hi, my name is Dominique Thomas. I'm currently in Decatur, Georgia, and I'm what a former associate editor, now incoming editor for the Community Psychologist. And I guess a sweet spot that we have for our publication is that we want people who are both academics and practitioners in the field to submit. And we also want to highlight the work of junior scholars and other scholars and community based practices that might not get as much attention in um, other areas or try to highlight a lot more. We want to highlight a lot more grassroots organizing in our submissions. And I think um, I think a quote secret that we have is that if you submit it, we'll publish it because we want it to be pretty, we want it to be pretty inclusive of everything that the field encompasses. So, you know, if you, you feel, if you feel like, you, if you may feel like your work may not fit one place, it's always a place for it in the TCP, whether it's an individual article or a column for any of the different councils, committees and interest groups, or even a special feature that you could come up with on your own um with like with uh with us helping you figure it out as well too so you know it can be a number of different ways that you can contribute or collaborate to the publication so if you submit something you'll most likely get it, uh get it accepted yes absolutely and uh, we want this also to be a space where we really celebrate community psychology and what is going on within the field, what's going on in communities. And so we also have our Scrum member spotlight and Scrum news. So we really want people to kind of send us, what are you doing? What are the things that are going on? And to kind of have this be a space where we can engage in these conversations, especially with uh, COVID right now. It's a, this, we want this to be kind of a space where we can talk about in, uh, engaging in either new or um, emerging methodologies or a place where even people can kind of workshop ideas about what are some things that we see and changes happening um, within higher ed and within our field. And so we kind of want this to be a space where we have those conversations as well. Yes, and also to reiterate our secret, you have to submit something, but that's the only secret. <laughs> All right, thank 
you. Um, I guess Nicole Allen. I didn't expect N, to come up N, in the alphabet o. so soon there. Yeah, we went from A, D to N. <laughs> N. Um, also you, Anne. Um, oh, I'll go, I'll go through it. I'll go at the end. That's fine. Okay. All right. Well, hello, everyone. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, I'm a professor at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, which is in central Illinois, about two hours south of the Midwestern city of Chicago in the US. And I am editor-in-chief of the American Journal of Community Psychology. Um, when I was thinking about what to share here, I was thinking about how I view the publication process. And I think of it really as a critical part of archiving our ideas and our actions. And I say this because I think in a field oriented to action, sometimes it can be tempting to feel like the publication work is not where the real work happens. Um, and I've, I've heard people say that sometimes. But I think that at their best, the publication venues, and I'm so glad that we have so many venues, allow for a conversation occurring across space and time. And so through our written scholarship, we share with each other, we push each other's thinking, ideally we challenge each other, we innovate, we inspire, and we archive that. So that people coming uh, later can look at that work and, um, and ground their work in what others are doing. So our aim at HACP, American Journal of Community Psychology, is to be an essential conduit for that process. Um, inspired by that aim, we publish a very wide range of empirical research and reviews that ideally advance knowledge, scholarship, and action in our field. And I do want to say that um, it's a very wide ranging topics. So at some point, if you haven't looked at the journal in a while, go take a look at the table of contents. Every time I create the lineup, I think this field is amazing. You know, the amount of ground that we are attempting to cover, even though we do it imperfectly, is really quite impressive and of course can grow and of course needs to be more expansive. But I think it's something that's exciting about our field, the, the wide range of um, topics that are being taken up. And I do want to emphasize, too, that EJCP um, really values methodological pluralism. So there really, I feel like, is er, every method is welcome. Um, rigor is not defined in terms of it was a quantitative approach. Um, there is qualitative research in the journal of a variety of traditions, quantitative work, there's mixed methodology. and um, and it's something that we value highly and we look for. And I also think it's important to note that we do publish work not only from the field of community psychology, but also from allied fields that, that are engaged in community-based research and that share some of our values. So we have work coming in from public health and um, education and social work. Um, and I think that's valuable too, because it keeps us less insular. It's actually good for the journal that we get submissions from other disciplines. And it's, it's good for that cross-fertilization and, and some interdisciplinarity, dis, interdisciplinarity in those um, conversations. I also want to point out that we have a variety of publication venue, uh, meth like approaches, right? So you can do an original article. That's often what people think about when they think about empirical research. But you can also do an empirical review. And, and one of my favorite formats in the journal are first-person accounts. I think that some of the most engaging and innovative work is done in the context of first-person accounts. They are not easy to write, but they're a really powerful venue because they are, allow for a narrative telling that pushes the field forward, but from more of a first-person standpoint. So sometimes people are writing and reflecting on a process they experienced in a project, or they're writing um, and reflecting on failures that they experienced in a project, things that did not go as planned, or best practices. And so I think that's a, a really nice um, format where can, people can bring their experiences through. And finally, I want to emphasize the value of special issues. I'm looking around the faces here, and more than one of you have a special issue in the works. Dominique Thomas has a special issue in the works. Rachel Fox has a special issue in the works. Nicole Friend has a special issue in the works. And I want to just say, like, yes to special issues. It becomes such a critical way for people to say, hey, I really want to bring a focus to a particular issue. This is something I want to, we want to be galvanized around. We want to be thinking about, and in the bringing together of papers, also pushing the field forward in that process, saying here's our current status and here's how we can push forward. So um, I want to say we welcome that. This is not really a secret, um, but having a really clear rationale for one study or review or account is, is um, really important. A rich integration with work that's come before. 
And that's something that really surprised me as an editor sometimes where we get papers and they're really not in that conversation with the work that's come before. They're not really making that connection. And I think, wow, you know, you gotta engage really and show that connection and make that tie. So I don't know that that's a secret, but definitely an important part, I think, of keeping that conversation alive in our scholarship. And I will stop there. Thanks. Um, I've been busy writing down notes as you all talk, so so continue. I'm I'm taking notes. <laughs> Nicole. I am um, another Nicole, Nicole Friend. Um, I'm a research scientist at the Center for Applied Research and Evaluation at Wichita State University's Community Engagement Institute. That there will be no quiz later on the title. That's way too long for anybody. But um, I am situated in Wichita, Kansas, U.S. Um, I am the editor of the Global Journal of Community Psychology Practice, and our focus is really on practice. It is for practitioners. Um, it is open access for that reason. Um, we know from talking to practitioners that access to academic journals can be very, very difficult if you don't have university privileges. And so um, we are actually in our 10th year this year 2020 is our 10 year anniversary and um, we've spent the last 10 years yay um, really trying to make sure that practitioners have the research and the information that they can use on the ground um, so tools are especially helpful we've published any number of tools from uh, the most famous uh, tier list logic model to tools about how to measure collaboratives um, to any number of other tools to help people who are actually in the field trying to do the work um, we are also in a current uh, right now, we are in a process for trying to redefine what it means to publish peer-reviewed work in an online journal. Um, the technology for how um, we disseminate information and what we call peer-reviewed and how we uh, build the canon and make sure that practitioners and others uh, have access to that information is not necessarily um, the publishing tradition is not necessarily keeping up with way that technology is progressing and so we're really investigating right now the different ways people know the different ways people can express um, knowledge to to perpetuate and you know as Nicole had mentioned um, pushing the field forward pushing the work forward making sure that um, we're not duplicating efforts uh, in several different ways so um, we're really excited to to start looking at different ways the the journal can evolve and um, include different types of submissions tools videos um, podcasts. We've actually published a couple of uh, Natalie's podcasts uh, in the past, so um, we're we're really excited about that um, moving forward. Um, I would say not really necessarily a tip or a trick, but any any time um, a submission comes in with supplementary materials like tools and videos, um, we're much more able to integrate that into um, issues that that are. Um, uh, more comprehensive. Um, we have an online platform that is it allows us to be more innovative in some ways, and we we like to be able to um, to exploit that to its fullest. So those supplementary materials are um, are really exciting for us. We also do special issues. We have a couple um, in the works. <laughs> Dominique is very busy. He's doing one for us too. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we have one on uh, the redefinition of community psychology practice that is also coming up. So um, we're, uh, we're very excited about uh, going into the future and really trying to build a, 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 a journal that takes that technology and moves it forward. Thanks, Nicole. Um, Rachel, who's going to make us feel like we are in Australia where we should be. <laughs> Although my accent from England <clears throat> uh, kind of ruins the, <laughs> the idea that I'm in. Yeah, so I'm um, Rachel Fox and I'm in Australia, of course, and I'm a co-chair of the conference, um, but I'm also editor of the Australian Community Psychologist 
Um, personally, I'm based in a town called Wagga Wagga, which is in New South Wales. It's about five hours north of most of the people you've seen in Melbourne, um, in the country. Uh, and I'm very used to working this way, virtually. A lot of my work is, is, was virtual before the pandemic. Um, so it's been interesting watching the rest of the globe um, come online. Um, so the Australian community psychologist and cheekily, although everyone else should do the same, I'm just going to um, put the URL of the journal in there so people can access it. Um, it's actually, in some respects, uh, quite a small journal compared to a lot of the people who are presenting their journals today. Um, but in other ways, uh, it may be bigger than, um, bigger than it might f at first appear. So it has a long history. It's about 35 years of history of, of that journal. It was originally called Network and now Australian Community Psychologist. And in those 35 years, it's always been publicly available. Um, originally, it was an email going round, I think, of uh, photocopied hand typed probably <laughs> that some of the we've actually got the archive of the originals and yeah it's hard to get those scanned well and things like that um and so it's always been fully open access and fully online a lot however has happened around it that has changed and so there's a lot more exciting opportunities for open access currently and i think that's fantastic um that this journal now has to meet as well um, because it's always maintained that desire to be open access more than anything, it's never sat with a proper publisher. And I think increasingly there are publishers who are doing innovative things now, but that wasn't always the case. And so I think we're also looking at what we might do going forward, uh, which I think is a very, very interesting times in the publishing world in general that will be interesting to talk about today maybe, but um, it doesn't sit with the publisher. It does sit with the Australian Psychological Society and it's hosted on their website and that, that helps a little bit. But it means that we do everything by, I don't know how better to describe it and say by hand, but we do everything ourselves. So we um, edit ourselves, we review, our, obviously everything's done and it's, it's cost free. Um, uh, it publishes twice a year. In fact, we've been worse hit this year with the pandemic and all sorts of issues. Um, you know, so it's, I think it's a sustainability has always been fragile, I would say. Um, what it works to publish, um, and one of the reasons why it prefers to, or has usually historically preferred to not sit with a publishing house, although I think that might be changing now in terms of what publishing houses offer, um, it's always worked to publish very scholarly, rigorously peer-reviewed work, but work that might struggle to get recognition elsewhere. That's always included, of course, Australian, New Zealand, Pacific um, publications, very much Indigenous Australian publications as well, and other First Nations work. Um, publications from other international authors, it has lots of international authorship as well. And very much from graduate, postgraduate, and early career researchers. Uh, we really strive to publish student work as well. And that's a real conscious um, decision. Uh, authors who may not have a traditional academic background and also subject matter, which might struggle to get published elsewhere. So highly critical, highly radical. And again, I think that's changing. And I really have um, enjoyed watching the, a lot of the journals you're presenting, um, you know, take on a lot of that content, which is fantastic. Um, what was I also saying? Something a secret. Um, helpful um, some publishing secret. Very much the same as Dominique. If you publish it, if you submit it, we'll, we will publish it. Um, I mean, that's another thing with reviews. We work quite hard at very detailed, constructive reviewing because some of our submissions might need that and we want to support. So it's very supportive. It's more work, definitely. Um, but we try to pub support people who submit. Um, and also we don't get lots of submissions. So we um, take care of every submission that we get. Um, so yes, if you, if you submit it, we're likely to publish it. And we're very supportive in the editing process. Um, I guess the general secret would be to, although it's infuriating in terms of the differences across different journals, it would always be to try to get 
their instructions right um, and when you're submitting um, getting everything formatted how they've asked and submit what they've asked and following the, the guidelines although that can be infuriating between different journals thank you thanks Rachel which takes us alphabetically to Ryan and then we will circle back to Katharina who's with us as well thanks Anne uh, first of all I'm Ryan Kilmer I'm at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte in the United States and I'm here representing the American Journal of Orthopsychiatry. Uh, it's an APA journal. It's the official journal of the Global Alliance for Behavioral Health and Social Justice. And I'll say from, from, from the outset, the journal itself is not specific to community psych. It's not specific to community work. Um, it's an interdisciplinary journal uh, at, at, at its core, but certainly does uh, publish community psychology and community uh, oriented work. I'm representing the journal's co-editors, Will Spaulding and Jill McLeay. Uh, they weren't able to be here today, and so that's me. I've been on the editorial board for about a decade and have guest edited some special issues and special sections. In terms of the journal, uh, we're really looking at a, we've got a broad audience. Um, when we think about the, even though it's published by APA, our membership includes uh, folks from anthropology to psychology to to social work, to public health, we've got some lawyers. Um, and, and so really we've got a, a broad representation there. And so we're really, that, that audience is, includes researchers, practitioners, educators, advocates, and recognizing the intersecting roles for, our, for many of us across, across those kinds of categories. Um, we seek manuscripts that aren't just, of course, quality, quality studies, but that really contribute to understanding or understanding about how policies and practices should be designed to promote um, behavioral health and social justice. And so that's really the theme that, that you're going to hear from, from me. Um, core to that then is the journal's really looking for clear and convincing implications. And I don't think that's unique as, as an aim to American Journal of Psychiatry or AJO. My sense from doing reviews over the years and for a number of journals is they put a bit more emphasis on it than some, or than many, I'll, I'll say. Um, too often the manuscripts submitted, uh, they don't actively engage or really develop implications, again, for this notion of how do we affect uh, behavioral health practice, policy, and social justice. Uh, discussion sections are really important in terms of articulating um, findings and, and how to and their implications or applications within those kinds of areas. The the content is is broad. I, I communicated with our our co-editors about this, and and because they're open to such a broad uh, variety of issues and concerns, there was, there was hesitance to to even say things at the risk of of narrowing the focus or the frame. Um, but what I can say is the AJO uh, publishes work that illuminates issues and. It's relating to the effects of social determinants of health um, and, and broad societal uh, ills and issues from, from racism and homophobia to poverty and, and community violence, um, a focus, a considerable focus on understudied and, and underserved uh, populations. And there's a lot of effort to prioritize uh, the, the needs, um, the, the rights, the voices of those who have been traditionally disempowered, disenfranchised, or marginalized. Uh, in terms of a helpful hint or, or secret or whatnot in terms of publishing, I think what has really struck me over time is how important it is to ensure that your paper tells a cohesive story, um, one that really hangs together. And, and I think one issue that we've encountered quite a bit is that you have these, dis for example, discussion sections um, that seem utterly disconnected from their introductions uh, or that are focused on the recapping of, of results rather than situating them in the broader literature, rather than really engaging and trying to explain or understand what are the potential mechanisms? How do we make sense of, uh, of the findings? And then really critically, then there's this so what? How do we, how do we hone in on the, on the implications? So one suggestion might be, you know, we're all so close to what we're writing about, right? It makes sense to us uh, to have somebody outside your er area, if it's the first time submitting to a journal like AJO, someone outside your area, give it a read and make sure that your intended meaning is coming through the way you want, that, that help, help make sure that we're, we're explaining things uh, carefully and, and, and clearly. And again, that notion of we wanna tell a story 
that outside opinion can, can really be helpful. I'll say uh, I, I found myself wanting to cheer along as people talked about um, special issues and special sections. Um, you know, for a while, uh, some of the journals under the purview of APA, they were encouraged not to do that because some of the metrics they were using were showing that they weren't getting some of the same download rates and whatnot. And it turned out some of that was an artifact of how they were tracking it and counting it in the systems. Um, so I'm very pleased to say that they're now, they're, you're increasingly seeing uh, encouragement around special issues and special sections. And that's something AJO has done, is doing, will continue to do. Um, I think it's just so critical in terms of how those sections, you can get these collection of papers that can really make such a meaningful contribution and move understanding uh, forward. So I'll, I'll stop there for, uh, for now, but thanks. Thanks, Ryan. And so um, we've got Katarina who's joined us and um, Chris Son is on as well. I don't know whether he's um, just monitoring everything as one of the uh, folks helping to run this, but um, both co-editors of um, CPGP, so I'll let um, Katarina or Chris jump in. Sure. Here is Katarina, but you're on mute. <laughs> and I saw Chris unmuted for a second. Whoever unmutes first. Okay. Here we go. I'm yeah. here. I think that because we are three, it would be nice to to give one sentence or a very short vision or each of us because this journal. Uh, community psychology in global perspective is global perspective because we have Anne from uh, US, Chris from Australia, me and Terry from Italy and to make a global perspective, a multicultural uh, inter interactive perspective is one of our goals. It, one, another goal is to have a scientific and well done journal and we take care of the quality of our contribution, not going on if they are qualitative or quantitative. We are open to mm, different topics uh, and we always want to go a little bit further with our, uh, on, on the matter, on the topic. And so we, um, we are open to what new we can collect and we are um, awaiting uh, from uh, good contribution and coming and setting issues from all around the world. I want to stop because I, I think it's nice to have two words from Chris, two words from Anne, so that we can share in this open space our uh, focus point, the focus point for each of us. Anne, Chris. Oops. <laughs> I, hi, everyone. I, I think I dropped in at the wrong time. I got put on the spot then. Um, I've been, sorry, I've been, I've been roving sessions a little bit <laughs> in, in the last couple of minutes. But uh, uh, thanks for that, Katarina. I think uh, what is the question is really just about uh, a statement about what the journal uh, aims to be doing. Yeah. Um, I guess, I don't know, we started, what, six, seven years ago um, with, with this journal and, and my understanding is Katarina has said we were, we were looking for an, a, a way to broaden um, the sort of places within which we could uh, collect uh, community psychologists from around, uh, around the world, I guess, in, in some sort of way. Um, so, so when we started off, I think a couple of the issues focused on some of the cultural sorts of, um, of foci and, and so it's been a, a real process of developing it so that we could, we could appeal to people in terms of the, the various indices that, that, uh, that's, uh, that's required uh, for people who are uh, in academic context and so forth. But I mean, from, from my own perspective, I think there's, there's sort of a real uh, a real attention too, because I think a lot of people are interested in in thinking and publishing a, a, a about community psychology prax, praxis um, and, ha and and how to do that within the sort of space that demands uh, particular sorts of understandings of science 
and sorts of reporting and, and so forth. So I, I think for, for, for me, um, the, the journal, I guess, is, is there um, to, uh, and, and we've constructed a sort of an edit, editorial board too that's, that, that's pulling people in from different regions and, and, and so forth. But, but we do have all sorts of challenges because I think of multilingualism, uh, different languages and, and a, whole, a host of other things that, um, that, we, that we have to consider in thinking about how, how do you actually have something that is, uh, that is global and inclusive when we have that, uh, that rich diversity? And how do, you, how do you construct a journal that has global in its title that can actually accommodate the, the pluriversality, I think, that we aspire to when we're actually thinking about community psychologies? So that's our broad sort of goal. And I think the, the practicalities and so forth of doing that is, I guess, the, the sets of things that we we are going to what is it, uh, have to consider um, as, we, as we try to ex expand and think uh, about community psychologies um, for, for this journal. So I think that's more than two words. Sorry, Katerina. <laughs> well, thank you, Chris. Thank you, Katerina. I'll jump in with one suggestion, at least from my perspective, um, is that so the, the journal really thinks about culture as a framework and culture as um, from an ecological perspective. And one of the things that I've noticed is that folks who are writing from more privileged positions, whether that's in the world in terms of the ways that, that their or our culture is seen or within their own personal context, oftentimes don't describe culture um, that's sort of the, the, you know, the air that they breathe and the water that they're swimming in. Um, and so for a journal like um, CPGP, it's really important to interrogate that cultural aspect and that framework and be explicit about what it is, even in conditions where we usually might assume that everyone knows what, what it is here. Um, so that's one suggestion. Um, so I think everyone's had a chance to do all the introductory things. And so we'd really love to open it up to, to your questions. If you want to put things in the chat, if you want to um, uh, wave or, or, or un uncloak is a sign that you um, want to ask a question. We have a question up in the chat already from Edward. Um, and Edward, do you want me to read it or do you want to chime in and ask your own question in your own voice? Uh, it's okay. You can read it. Oh, darn. But at least we heard a voice. That's exciting. Um, so Edward had a question about um, the different journals, policies, terms, and conditions regarding qualitative research articles. Um, and so I'm not sure if everyone has a chance to, to jump in or some people want to, and we can then say, yep, yeah, ours is kind of like that or different or who wants to? Everyone's nodding. Nicole kind of started us off by saying that it's really something that um, AJCP is um, very interested and open to. Anything yeah, you're looking would, for in particular? I would reiterate that. Um, you know, I, I would say high quality qualitative work. I'll make a general observation that sometimes we get qualitative submissions um, that are very descriptive. At the, the, the quantitative equivalent that I would make is it, was, it would be like just telling me about the means and standard deviations of the work. And, it's, and there's not that kind of analytic overlay. So they might say, well, we talked to youth and youth said these four things, A, B, C, and D. It's very descriptive. But sometimes doesn't like achieve that analytical level. You know, what was it that the qualitative work uniquely positioned you to do to pursue a question? But in terms of qualitative methodology, we welcome it. Um, I find it to be extraordinarily rich. I love qualitative submissions. And so, you know, keep them coming. So that's just a general remark, but it's not a term, you know, it's um, really just something we're very open to. A quick follow-up question. Um, do you need the transcript of the, the, the interviews? No. That would be, we would not do that because we would never look at them, right? But um, we, do, we do encourage ver sharing of verbatim. Um, so where you are making, you're supporting, a war you're having a warranted conclusion by sharing some of that verbatim from the interview. 
And um, one of the things too, in some of the international submissions we have, we've sometimes had questions about translation and back translation, where there are sometimes, um, be, there might be issues in meaning that arise because when the work originally done in a, in a, in a, a language other than English is then translated into English, we sometimes will go back and forth a little bit in a constructive way around meaning. Was the meaning captured? Because sometimes the verbatim and the meaning that seems to be coming through in the verbatim doesn't totally match the description that the author has. Um, so certainly we want to see support of verbatim, but you do not need to submit transcripts or any sort of original data as support. Um, Hi, everybody. Oh. No, go. You sure? Yeah. Uh, um, I just uh, thank you for uh, the descriptions and the information you all gave around your journals. It's really nice to hear, like, see the faces uh, behind the websites and that information. I uh, wanted to ask uh, kind of a broader question and then a question specific to special issues. Um, so I wanted to know in terms of the structures of journals or sort of their mission statements, is there anything that you all um, intentionally include around targeting um, and offering support for people of color, scholars of color, indigenous scholars to be um, given a particular space and support to be part of your journals, um, whether that is through special calls out for issues that are really um, targeting that group of scholars, or if there's particular um, structural support that you give to um, scholars that are underrepresented in psychology, such as, um, you know, Black scholars, Latinx scholars, Indigenous scholars. Um, that's my overall question for whoever wants to comment on that in terms of using journals as a way to create equity and practice um, the values that we hold as community psychologists. Um, my more specific technical question, and I think um, I want to say, um, let's see, I think Nicole Allen, I think you spoke around special issues. And so wanting to know just maybe the general process in which one can um, petition a special issue and then if there is any um, tips on how to get that going um, in, uh, in journals in, in general and kind of like, I think like uh, more than like, of course the process, but also thinking like the unwritten things that are, uh, that are not written down, but that are preferred in terms of submissions. I think there's a lot of like understated things that um, as, uh, that I think are not always said and you kind of have to learn through doing. And so I would love to hear more about the things that are not said in terms of petitioning to do a, a special issue, for instance, or publishing in that way. So those are my two um, questions. Great, so those are two very rich, rich questions. Thank you. Um, someone want to take the first and then we'll get to the second one and let Nicole lead off. Um, I was going to, I've just made a note of all those because I think they're really fascinating questions. They relate a little bit as well to what was asked about qualitative research. Qualitative research has traditionally been harder to get published. I think it's been great actually in recent years to see um, these journals that we're looking at now um, increase that kind of output equally for uh, scholars who are underrepresented in all sorts of different ways we're seeing increase. I think at the same time it's important to just to, to be transparent about the fact that there is a culture of publishing which is in and of itself excluding. Um, there are expectations around what language is used in a journal article in terms of it being very formal um, English um, there are expectations around what a journal article will include in terms of content. And I think we do have to um, discuss um, among journal editors and, and organisers of journals as well as writers, um, the fact that there is this discursive culture which is very exclusionary, uh, which is assumed and we need to challenge that and resist that. Um, in my journal, we publish more qualitative research than quantitative, actually. Um, and in terms of special support for scholars who are underrepresented or how a special issue would occur, I see certainly for our role that we work and think a lot, because we can as well, we're a smaller journal, we're not in a publishing house, we don't have an administrative 
team that we would have to prevent from doing all sorts of things. Uh, we can riff a little bit, I suppose, is a good way to say it. And so I think that's a great space for scholars who are underrepresented because it's possible for me to go, well, I actually think this way of doing peer review shouldn't be applied in this case, or um, I think this special issue should happen. And the other thing that I think is very important for scholars who are emerging, underrepresented, marginalised in the publishing space is that the, the, the journals are providing support for those scholars and not just expecting those scholars to um, do everything themselves. So, for example, uh, work I've done before has been to have emerging scholars and then um, support academics to work with them. Now, the academics shouldn't take over and produce highly formal papers. I think there needs to be some innovation there and that should be explained as well. Um, yeah, that's my answer to that. All those questions. I would, I would build on that to say that, um, you know, when we talked about launching into a, sort of a new vision for, for the way we wanted to publish, the big impetus for that was equity. We felt like what we were doing was not enough. It wasn't good enough. It wasn't enough to, to support those voices that were not being given the right amount of um, amplification. And so a lot of the work that we're doing to try and, and uh, rediscover what community psychology practice can and should look like in the publishing space is around equity. Um, we do have a special issue about anti-racist praxis, praxis. That's the one that Dominique is co-editing with um, a couple of others. Um, and we certainly uh, encourage that type of, of work as well. Um, but we also want to be able to support the different ways of knowing and the different ways of dissemination that might not be um, a part of the traditional publishing um, arena. Thank you. Um, so Scott Evans just got here. He was stuck in traffic. I mean, stuck in a meeting. Um, and I also just put a whole lot of information in from two of our colleagues um, in Italy who were to be with us representing um, the Italian Community Psychology Journal. Couldn't be here because of the time change. So tons of information on what they would have said. But let me let Scott jump in. And then um, I promised Joy we'd get to her question as well. I can say something because I am on the board of the Italian Journal too, in this Rivista di Psicologia di Comunità. And this is a very long, this journal that has something like 20 years on. But at the beginning, but we had the jump in the international arena from two years. And so we are at the beginning in this international challenge, but the, uh, the tradition, the roots of the journal are very old and it is uh, very significant in Europe with contribution from Italian, European and also US uh, community psychology. And we started from the first chair of community psychology in the university and then the practical field. And it is a journal with a scientific description of intervention with some theoretical uh, aspect, but not so much. Much more description of intervention and description of research, failed research, participatory action research, and taking into account all the topics that are uh, loved or in the core business of community psychology. So we are, you are all welcome to collaborate and we will be pleased to enlarge the journal also to a, a wider international audience. Thank you, Catalina. Um, Scott. Hey everybody, uh, embarrassed to join so late, but if, if any of you ever served on a faculty senate, you know how sometimes those things can be unpredictable. This one was certainly unpredictable, oh my goodness. Anyway, um, I'm a editor of a open access, uh, free to submit, free to read um, online journal called Collaborations. Uh, the link is in the chat. Um, 
and it's a relatively new journal. It's a partnership between University of Miami and Rutgers University, um, really focused on trying to support and amplify uh, scholarship that comes out of university community partnerships and really attending to the, the messiness and the, the joy of uh, doing that type of scholarship and practice. Um, we're also really open to uh, student reflections and student um, submissions, so we're uh, kind of calling out for more of those, and we have the capacity to kind of take on alternate forms of uh, uh, of documentation, right? So multimedia, audio, um, whatever folks can kind of dream up or, or willing to review as um, a scholarship for the journal. So the link is there. You can reach out to me if you have questions, but uh, please spread the word, especially if you're working with students who are doing interesting things and may not think that they are doing something worthy of publication. Um, we're willing to look at it for our, our student portal of the journal. And good to see everybody. Thanks, Scott. I'm, I'm glad you could get out of that faculty meeting. This can really get, get to you. Um, and, and you actually raised a point, which was Joy's point. And so um, I, I think lots of other people might jump on this as well. Uh, she was interested in whether um, you need to be, um, uh, I think, in academics or whether our um, journals are interested in work from experienced psychologists who are in practice. Let's do it this way. Show of hands for um, everyone whose journal would accept practice um, art practitioner's article. No. One of the challenges that we talk about, and I don't know how others experience this, is um, you know what's the what's the payoff for those in practice for for publication, right? What's the what's the reward? We know a lot of academics seek publications because it goes in our beta, and we can use it for promotion and tenure. Um, so one of the things that we've been struggling with is how to incentivize, um, you know, practitioners in some way uh, to um, to submit their work because they're doing a lot of incredible work, even if it's not kind of formatted in an academic way. <laughs> I'm muted. Um, not, not seeing other questions. Natalie, you just uncloaked. Do you have a, a question? Yes. Sorry, I was okay. muted. Or I would have stayed on video because I know it's nice to see people's faces. Um, I have a question um, that I think I know the answer for some of the journals, but I still think it's um, something that I would love to put out to everyone because I've already chatted with some of you about kind of like other, and I think Nicole Friend spoke kind of specifically to this, the supplemental materials, the creative materials, the ways that we kind of do knowledge mobilization and translation outside of um, traditional written components. So I'm just interested to see like where that is either acceptable, feasible, meaningful. Um, I know there's some work in Canada happening right now around um, creating podcasts as scholarly output rather than as supplemental material as kind of the core distribution of, of knowledge and there's some interesting peer review things happening around podcasts at the moment. Chris, who has hopped off and I are working on um, some podcast pieces that we're going to be talking about tomorrow um, and are working on putting together a special issue for the um, global perspectives, community psychology and global perspectives. So I'm just curious because so many of us are doing really creative arts-based stuff. How can that be integrated into your journal? Um, and what are you doing kind of proactively to ensure that we're capturing a lot of this creative and diverse sets of, of ways of knowing and, and translating information? So I think oh, um, one Sorry, I think for us, one of the ways in which we did, since we started this actually under Susan Wolf, a previous editor, was going away from print copies and doing that actually allowed us space to invite more submissions for people because when you have to print it, that's, that costs money and that means you have to limit how many pages it is. So that means you limit how many submissions that you can accept from people. But once we removed that financial barrier, we were able to include more people in perspective. So that allowed us to include more things from practitioners, more things from underrepresented scholars and emerging scholars, and to have a broader view of everything that's happening in the field because we had 
we had been able to actually open up the space for more people to submit and to actually include more people as well. Um, so going more virtual, I think we're also thinking about different ways in which we can also incorporate multimedia into TCP. So thinking about having maybe like a featured scholar podcast. So maybe from one of the submissions that we have for a particular issue, we could interview a scholar who submitted to that issue on their particular topic so they can discuss it more. So we have definitely been thinking about ways that we can introduce more types of media and different things we can pilot for the future. I could piggyback Hi. off that. Um, first of all, um, American Journal of Orthopsychiatry is, is certainly open to, to supplemental materials. And, and I'm gonna morph your question just a bit, Natalie, because I think one of the things that we, we struggle with often is how can we communicate our findings to a broader audience? Um, whether it's via the media, whether it's to policymakers. And so one thing the journal has been trying to do, some of it in, in, in concert with APA, but has, has been around recording podcasts with authors, how to tap into social media um, in terms of posting uh, interesting findings and looking for uh, uh, organizations or groups that could also share in, in helping kind of elevate, elevate those findings, really trying to push, you know, things like public policy relevant statements to help, help make some of the work real and, and um, in a more meaningful package, if you will, to, to the folks who won't be necessarily reading um, the articles in the same way. So I, first off, yes, and there are lots of ways to um, indeed convey uh, and capture knowledge. And I think part of what I hope we'll see continued growth around is what kinds of ways we can disseminate to reach, reach those audiences so we're just not speaking to one another. Thank you. And I'm looking at the time. It looks like our 55 minutes are just about up. Um, um, Rachel will correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I haven't even so, too engaged in the session. <laughs> I really want to thank all of the panelists for taking the time um, to be part of this and, and sharing their ideas and, and their journals. Thank all of you for, um, for joining us here live or, or tuning in later. Um, we all look forward to um, receiving your uh, manuscripts and there's uh, lots of other venues that um, couldn't be with us tonight. So we hope that you'll look into those as well. I also, I think we all hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. And here is a heartfelt wish from all of us that we will all be together as a community in real life very soon. Be well, everyone. Yeah, thank, thank you, you everybody. Much. If you did have questions you. you wanted to ask, you can pose them when you go to the conference platform, which you'll be able to access for a long time. The recording of this will be in the program and there's a discussion section next to it. So I'd encourage anyone to ask any more questions if they want to.